Yeah. Okay, so last time from last event, in the exciting days of the before time, we we're looking at our good dear friend Spinoza, and we saw him offering us a solution to the problem of emotional distress. And the idea, according to him, was realize that it is all gone, all that occurs occurs by necessity. And he claims that once we realize that the emotions are, well, our response to the emotions is based on a, you know, our belief that things could have been otherwise and that things can be different. And once we realize that all things, all things happen by necessity, we'll realize that things cannot have been otherwise, things cannot be different, and so we'll feel less bad about it until we'll achieve the goal that we claim. So in conclusion of the Spinoza stuff, his claim is, is that once a person becomes wise, the person will become unmoved, or mostly unmoved, because they'll be aware of that necessity, that all is gone, all things that happen must happen as they did and as they will be, and he thinks that that's the way towards peace, or so he claims. But he thinks it's a difficult thing, oddly enough, because much like Aristotle before him, he believes that all the noble and good things are rare and difficult. And then he died, and of course he's still dead today. So what impact did our good dead friend Spinoza have? Well, one question, of course, is, is he offering a life that is desirable? Because what ethics is supposed to do one thing supposed to do is tell us what we should do, how we should live our lives. But it should also tell us the life that is that we should want, the desirable life. So is what he offers desirable? Is that a good life plan? Well, imagine, imagine if you will, if you if you were able to undertake the Spinoza plan and you accept it, you wake up and say it was all by necessity. Nothing, nothing can be any different than, than it was. Nothing shall be any different from it is. Don't worry. Be happy. Would that have been his already effect? Does that work? Well, no, if you have motivation and goals, dreams. Yeah, yeah your motivation, goals, and dreams are getting in the way. So you got to get rid of, rid of those. I guess that one way to, uh, I mean, it's something you can test. I mean, you can try to be um, Spinoza for a day. And you wake up in the morning and say that. You know, everything bad that happens, you know, like, <clears throat> your, your breakfast burrito catches on fire. <laughs> burrito flambe. <laughs> you know, like, it is, it is a necessity. My burrito could not have been otherwise. Someone cuts you off, it could not have been otherwise. You, you know, someone steals your phone, it could not have been otherwise. <laughs> your favorite group breaks up, it could not have been otherwise. <laughs> and so, you know, one, one thing to do is test it. See if it is, in fact, a effective and desirable way of life. Of course, there's also the question of, is it actually true? Now, one concern that critics have raised is this, especially Valentine's Day coming up. Spinoza says, you know, our problem is having relations with other people, being tied to them. And what we should do is you know, realize that things, you know, what was had to be, what is going to be has to be, things cannot be different. And your focus should entirely be on God. Now, does that work <laughs> for life? I mean, if you truly, if someone, if you truly accept the Spinoza's view, that in the sense, relations with people, emotional bonds to, you know, anything, except for God, is, is a mistake. You shouldn't have that. Would that be a desirable sort of life? Well, I guess it depends on how bad you think people, how strong you think people are. You know, that people are the problem. Yeah, because critics have said, you know, someone who is, because he was a celibate, you know, lens grinder. And so for some people, that can work out, you know, quite, quite well. You know, there are some people who don't have any interest in that kind of stuff. But then a good question would be, is that, you know, true of everybody? Yeah, so it comes down to, I guess, something empirically testable. Well, they might want to, might want to test it on Valentine's Day, whether that kind of emotional, you know, distance is the right way. And this is not just a philosophical abstract question. It's a question about how to live your life. I mean, should we have formed these deep attachments to other people and pets, knowing that they're going to you know, die, betray us, etc.? 
Because as we come into life, we know how it's going to end. As soon as you get a pet, it's a cute puppy. It'll grow up, and one day we'll, we'll die. And the same is true of us. We'll grow up, and one day, you know, we're all cute now, and one day we'll be, you know, old and spooty and, and dead. <laughs> oh, man, it's so sad. <laughs> and so the question is, you know, what sort of relations should we have to, should we have to other people? Are they worth it, despite the fact that they will betray us, they will die? Now, another concern, of course, that comes up with any view that accepts necessity is addressing concerns about you know, social change, social justice. So if we take, for example, an issue that's covered today, um, police, you know, excessive use of force. Now, one way to look at it is, you know, that could change. You know, that should change. But if you're nosy, you'd say, well, that person, you know, police shot him because they had to shoot him. Things could not have been different. There's nothing we can, can do. And so one concern, even though it can kind of lead to acceptance, there's nothing I can do, it can also lead to acceptance. There's nothing I can do, which could be to be bad. Now, interestingly, Spinoza himself, despite his view, had many close friends, which seems kind of ironic given his view, and was very concerned and involved with politics in his nation. For example, in 1672, the DeWitt brothers were blamed as scapegoats for his country's problems and killed by a mob. And enraged by this, Spinoza you know, tried to run out to the street to denounce the murderers. And his friends locked him up in a room to save his, his life, which hardly seems like what someone who was, who was detached from life would do. So there is that, that important question. Would this help? Now, one possibility, of course, is with Spinoza's view and also like the Stoics' view, is to accept some of it. Because are there some things we can't change that we could not have done otherwise? Yeah, and accepting that, you know, if there are things we couldn't have changed, then, and of course the past is the past. We can't undo the past. So it'd be useful to have that sort of acceptance. You know, I can't change what I did. Of course, then we can also accept that if we can't change what we did, we can change what we will do. The second problem, coherence. This is something you know, brought up before. Hobbes runs into the same sort of problem. If we take, you know, if we take a view like this, which says it's all necessary, Hobbes tries to give us advice. This is how you should do politics or what can us. Suppose it says you want to avoid suffering and pain. This is what you do. Now, if everything has to be as it is, is advice going to use? Hmm. I, gave, you know, I gave the analogy before. If you're at a movie, it doesn't do any good to yell at the movie. Mm -hmm. Sadly, no. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or, or another analogy like with those, with, if you see someone playing a game, you know, if, if they're playing, you could say, you know, look out, you know, don't stand in the fire, or you know, get away from that thing. But if it's a cutscene, you can yell advice on all day, but it's like, dude, it's cutscene, I can't do anything. <laughs> and then the dragon's going to step on your face. I know, that's the way it's scripted. It steps on your face. Nothing you can do. <laughs> yeah, so if it's all, you know, if life is just a cutscene, and it's all like a movie, then advice is pointless, because people can't do other ones. So, interestingly, boringly enough, to give advice about how we should live our lives require, seems to require the belief that we can do other ones. That we, we could, maybe we can't change the past, but we can determine the future. So what impact did our good dead friend Spinoza have? Well, he must have had some. Because, you know, I included in the class, unless I just like to include obscure, <laughs> obscure people just, you know, for the heck of it. But some people do. Now, he, like other thinkers of this time, tried to do, do the big picture approach to create a coherent, systematic attempt to explain all of reality, which is you know, kind of the project of philosophy, science, religion to this day, to answer the question of life, the universe, and everything. And unfortunately for Spinoza, he kind of got uh, eclipsed by later thinkers. It's kind of like, um, you know, when in, uh, I guess he's kind of like a person who maybe like won like a high school championship, but they're 
sister won like the Olympic gold medal. Yeah. Good effort, but sorry. <laughs> Your sister is far more cool. <laughs> now, despite this, he had a lasting impact throughout the centuries. In the 18th century, for some reason, the poets, the romantic poets, uh, such as uh, Goethe, Schelling, Coleridge, Wordsworth, found him very appealing. They just like read him, and I guess they were drinking a lot, and said, hey, this guy's pretty, pretty awesome. Or whatever drugs they did back then. Opium. I'm guessing opium. Still a thing uh, these days. Opium, always popular. Now, they called him the god intoxicated philosopher. So weirdly, romantic poets, which is kind of odd considering what he said, because if you're thinking like which poets are right about Spinoza, probably the last thing I would think would be romantic poets. I guess it'd be something like roses are red, violets are blue, Spinoza said things, happy Valentine's Day to you. So reversing that poetry. Now, then in the 19th century, the metaphysicians found him very appealing. There's a, a guy, uh, Hegel, who I recommend you never read. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I recommend you don't, you don't read that. Um, he claimed that when you begin philosophizing, you must begin with Spinoza. Hegel was the guy who influenced uh, Marx, Karl Marx, the least funny of the Marx brothers, you know, with the whole uh, dialectical materialism. The idea, and Hegel had, you know, there was this idea of the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Marxists also found his view appealing for some reason, because they they liked. Uh, oh, one thing they had in common was Spinoza, of course, had metaphysical necessity because of God's nature. It's all got to go the way it goes. The Marxists have an economic necessity. So instead of they're atheists, of course, because Marxism. Is going on. But they believe that it was still determined, determined, a deterministic system. So you can, you don't like Marx, I mean, you don't like Bernie Sanders, you can blame Spinoza. So in a way, kind of a direct path to from Spinoza to Bernie Sanders. So 21st century liberal. In the 20th century, some thinkers, and also the 21st century, because we are in the 21st century, which is supposed to be really cool. We're supposed to have like moon bases and, you know, mechs and Gundams and cool stuff. And all we got is Facebook. <laughs> I'm so disappointed. <laughs> I need to put that on Facebook. I am disappointed by no think that there is Facebook. So in the 20th century, some people found his, that dual aspect theory of healing. And here's one. Science, of course, tells us it's all just, you know, material stuff. You know, ran to that, that view, you know, earlier in the class. But we also have this longing to talk about, you know, mind and emotions and so forth. And dual aspect theory lets us have our cake and eat it too. So it lets us have our mind without having a mind. And some might regard it as kind of a cheat because you're saying, well, looked at one way, it's material. Another way, it's non-material. So you can't reduce the mind to the body, but there's not really dualism. And some might say that's just you know, BSG. You're just throwing words around. I will say no, no, it's it, it's okay. You know, it's it's like the you know the DLT. You know, it's cool, <laughs> cool on one side, warm the other way. You put them together into one delicious thing. So there's two things that are actually they're not really two. They're one. They're not one. They're two. And of course, for some people, the whole BS detector goes up pretty heavily for that. Finally, he had a huge impact on our good dead friend Albert Einstein, known for being a patent clerk and theory of relativity, also making bad hair fashionable, which of course leads directly to Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. So it's all connected. Einstein said that he believed in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists. And one quote attributed to Einstein was this, God does not play dice with the universe. And the idea is that the universe is a logically determined or best known through reason and not through empirical probabilities. Now, this of course takes us into one of the disputes of you know, physics in the 21st century. 
the idea of whether there's randomness and chance or not. And it's a you know it's a core fundamental question. We you know saw sort of the breakdown of free will, chance, determinism, and it's a basic question of physics. Is there actually chance in the universe? Or is it all deterministic? Or is there some free will in there as well? So what's the answer? Yeah, well, I like free will. Let's go with that. Now, what about chance? Is there a chance? Is there randomness? I mean, we do have dice. You know, they seem to roll and do things. But what would a universe, suppose you could travel through universes. You had a, uh, let us say, uh, 1979 or 1972 gremlin. Let's Google it. <laughs> and you are, or one of those, um, what's it, Camino? The truck car things, but anyways, you got like a ground, and you can travel through the dimensions. And suppose you travel to a world that was determined there's no chance. What would Las Vegas look like in such a world? No, it'd look exactly like like our world. Because people would, you know, you would know because your gremlin, you know, thing would say, We are now entering the world of determinism. You know, you sort of fashion your seatbelt. And so for the people would know though, to them it would seem, you know. Be talking about chance, but suppose you went to a world that was, you know, had chance. What would it look like? Oh, just like, oh, look, just like our world. Yeah, because you know, if you see the dice rolling, you, do you actually see the chance? No. No, you just see dice rolling. You, you don't see chance. You don't see lack of chance. From our standpoint, there's no way to tell whether it's truly random or determined. We would have to, we would need that, you know, magic gremlin that had the thing telling us, you're a universe of chance, or this universe is determined. Yeah, from the inside, it all looks the, the same. I mean, in order to use um, another analogy, think of a movie. You know, if you're watching, suppose you're watching a movie of dice rolling. Now, can you tell if the, the shot is like an honest shot, really showing dice, or if the shot was, you know, you know, rigged. You get the, you know, it's like a James Bond movie, for example. You know, where of course, you know, he wins the, the games. Now, looking at it, can you tell whether it's just a, a clip? So, as you see a short clip of dice rolling, can you tell whether the dice were really rolling randomly, or whether that was a rigged shot for the movie? No, it looks the, the same. I mean, I have suspicions. Like, when you know, they do the basketball shot, they show this person shooting. You know, then they, of course, it go, goes in. You probably figure there's, you know, there's some trickery going on. But you really can't, unless you see the trickery, you really can't, can't tell. Yeah, so one problem is, is that from inside the world, we can't tell whether there's a chance or not. Now, we have theories that tell us, you know, we have, you know, theories about uh, in mathematics about it. But my own view is we really can't tell, because a world that would be random would look just like a world that is determined. You'd have someone be outside of the world to be able to look at, like, the label, you know, a random world, Mark V. Or determined world, Mark said. So that brings us to the end of Gottfried Wilhelm Spinoza. So be sure to have a Spinozistic Valentine's Day. So if you forget, you know, if it doesn't go well to say, just tell yourself, yeah, you had a necessity, you had to do that way. <laughs> well, now, well, before we go into our good dead friend, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, anything about Spinoza that needs more Spinoza? Can I turn to Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz? He was German or Germanish because back in the time that Leibniz was Leibnizing, there was no unified Germany. There was like a German culture or German language, but Germany was broken up, well, existed as various um, states. all the pixels. Just like that Adam Sadden movie, all those pixels getting into my, my brain. Probably giving me some kind of pixel disease. Probably Sandlerism or something. I'll start enjoying Adam Sadden movies. Oh God, please, please kill me if it comes from that. <laughs> now, during what is now Germany of that time, there was a language division. Like much of Europe, the common folks spoke the native language, be it English or French or German. 
and the upper class in Germany spoke French because the nobility, many of them were from France. And of course, the scholars wrote in Latin. Latinists, though, wrote primarily in, in German. Now, Germany had changed quite a bit. There was, of course, the Reformation with Martin Luther and the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648 that you know, disrupted the German states. Now, during this time period, Leibniz had the good fortune, or perhaps bad fortune, to be the only major German thinker. So, I guess, kind of worked out well for him. He was born in 1646 in Leipzig, Germany. He could still go there today. They probably have some type of statue or uh, maybe like a sausage you know, stand devoted to him, Leibniz sausage. He was one of those child um, prodigies, that they, you know, the, the genius. At age 13, he was reading the works of scholastic philosophers. He went to the university at age 15, graduated at 17. Then he went to study mathematics and returned to study uh, law in Leipzig, but was blocked in his attempt to get his doctorate. He got his doctorate in law at age 21 from the University of Altdorf near Nuremberg. You can still visit Nuremberg today, the site of the infamous Nuremberg trials after World War II. He was offered the position of a professorship, but decided to become a diplomat and an administrator. And so he traveled to Europe as a diplomat, kind of the John Kerry of his time. He met many of the great thinkers of Europe, including uh, Nicholas Malbranche, who was the Cartesian, who supposedly went through Paris kicking cats to hear the sounds they made. Yeah. And I can only assume he was murdered by cats one night, they all getting up. <laughs> It's a good story, and a good story is always better than the truth. He also met uh, Robert Boyle, uh, Boyle's you know, ideal gas law, an English chemist, Henry Oldenburg, the secretary of the Royal Society, and our good dead friend Spinoza. Now, in addition to his diplomatic, he also has a claim to fame in the area of computer science. Well, a couple of claims to fame. One is he built one of the first computers, a calculating machine that could add, subtract, extract roots, multiply, and divide. And this got him a membership in the Royal Society for that early computer. Now, since he was a diplomat and making calculators, most of his philosophy was not systematic. So he really was a diplomat first and kind of did philosophy you know, on the side. And so we, we have like pamphlets, essays, uh, a couple of books. And so, but he wasn't a very systematic sort of philosopher. So what did he hope to, to do with his diplomacy? Well, he had two purposes. One was this. He wanted to unite Europe, to bring Europe together, and to form one united Europe. How was that worked out? Well, kind of, yeah, kind of, no. Because Europe, you know, from well, from Europe, if you want to begin, up until the end of World War II, Europeans, their favorite hobby was killing each other. And they travel to places to kill other people, too. Right. <laughs> yeah, we are awful. <laughs> but some good food. Some good food. Not in England, of course. They're not going to England for the food. I mean, fish and chips, uh, toad in a hole, every bit of every. Oh, the, the Scots are worse stuff. They have like haggis. So, yeah. French, though, it's good stuff. <clears throat> Fortunately, I get my cooking skills from the French side of the genes. So I can, I can apply heat to things and not just pour and put it. So he wanted to unify Europe. Now, again, for one hand, it kind of didn't work out well because Europeans spent a lot of time killing each other. But now we have the, you know, the European Union, the EU, which looks like it's going to maybe be breaking apart once more because of the refugee crisis. So his dream was of a unified Europe. So still a work in progress. Secondly, after the Reformation, which of course split you know, the Catholic Church into fragments, which then fragmented and fragmented some more, he wanted to reunify Christianity into one faith. Now how'd that work out? Yeah, now we have more, more distinct uh, sects of Christianity than ever before. 
But when was the last time that there was a war between Christians over Christianity? Yeah, when was the last time there was like Protestants who were riding against Catholics to chop them up? Yeah, quite a while ago. So today you might have disputes, you know, a few angry words on YouTube, you know, against the uh, people, you know, calling up Mitt Romney for his Mormonism, etc. But yeah, in a way, Christianity is not unified under one church, but that you don't have those, you know, religious wars that you used to, at least for now. So, kind of success. Could have been worse, I guess. Now, despite the fact that he was doing philosophy kind of on the side, he does have three major works. The first, The New Essays Concerning Human Understanding. Secondly, The Theodicy. And I always thought it was the, the Odyssey, but it's just The Odyssey. Now, Theodicy is essentially a branch of theology and philosophy, as we'll see, dealing with the problem of evil, the problem of reconciling God with evil. It's considered one of the great problems you know, with monotheistic faiths. And his major work in metaphysics was the monadology, about monads. For real, he kind of made that up. So was our good dead friend up to before he was dead. Well, like most of the folks we're looking at, he wanted to essentially answer all the questions. So here are his main goals. Goal one. Like Descartes, he wanted to use math to develop a concept of universal harmony. He also wanted to use theology. So like the many of the other dead guys, mathematize the world. Secondly, like Descartes, he wanted to reconcile science and religion. Mechanism and teleology, modern and ancient philosophy, and of course cats and dogs, given the lived together in harmony. Now, like Descartes, and many of the other thinkers we've looked at and look at, he believed that, well, science and philosophy of his time, he looked at kind of like a well, like a country store. You know, stocked with all kinds of interesting things, well stocked, but disorganized and chaotic. So he believed there's a lot of good stuff in there, but it's just kind of a mess. So he wanted to order things. So his goal is pretty much the same as most of the other, other folks he looked at. He believes everything is kind of in disarray. He wants to order it. He wants to find you know, the one correct method to answer the questions of life, the universe, and everything. So what is his method going to be? Well, he's going to use what everybody loves, which is, of course, logic and mathematics. Because if people ask, you know, or ask what they want to do on a Saturday night, top two answers are, of course, logic and math. What to do. I think Jenga is a, a third. It's a third thing. Now, he believed, like Descartes, that logic and math can lead us to the truth. And he had great faith in logic. Now, he was influenced by Galileo. Galileo believed the universe is a harmonious system written in the language of mathematics by God. And this is a view, I mean, the God part, most physicists don't accept anymore. But it's still accepted to this day that the language of the universe is mathematics. Even though, again, most physicists today would not bring in the God part. So it's a language without an author today. Now, he doesn't, well, he kind of liked Descartes, but he rejects Descartes' view. Why? Well, we'll see this um, view that concern raised in later thinkers, but he thinks Descartes, or Cartesianism, is a gateway drug to Spinozism, which is a gateway drug to atheism. It's kind of like how um, you know, Nancy Reagan would tell us to just say no to things because it'd be a gateway to worse stuff. Like just say no to Red Bull, because that leads to marijuana, which leads to heroin, which leads to Twinkies, which leads to Cheetos. It's a, a, deadly, a deadly cycle. Mm -hmm. So we thought that if you accept the Descartes view, 
you'd end up with spinoza. And you end up with that horrible, horrible pantheism. So he doesn't want any of that. Ironically, as we'll see, it seems like he might end up with pantheism himself. Because as the as they often say, we become what we hate the most. Now, what really shaped his method, though, his logic, is this. Leibniz developed binary mathematics, which is this. Rather interestingly, rather importantly, you can express all numbers as combinations of zeros and ones. Also, as we found out with the you know, development of computers, you can do all kinds of stuff with zeros and ones. To illustrate, if you're looking at you know, your smartphone, tablet, or computer right now, what's behind all that is binary logic. It's all, I mean, you see maybe cat pictures on Facebook, or you know, the notes, or whatever you're, you're gazing upon, but behind that is all zeros and ones. It's all, you know, that's like a picture of a cat on the internet is just zeros and ones. It's all binary. And so, very important to develop it, because without that notion, it probably wouldn't have been, well, we could probably, we might be able to develop different sorts of computers, but the entire information age, the Facebook, the Xbox One, the PlayStation, the Twitter, uh, Snapchat, Tinder, all rest upon the power of the zero and one, thanks to our good dead friend, Leibniz. Now, he believed that by analogy, if we could reduce all mathematics to zeros and ones, he thought we could, by analogy, do that with everything. So he wanted to be able to explain life, the universe, and everything by finding the, the simples and doing a similar sort of analysis. And he had a pretty good model there because, again, we can do amazing things with just zeros and ones. Everything that appears in your computer, zero and one. Be it uh, you know a picture, a word file, a movie streaming on Netflix, it's all ultimately just zeros and ones. Now, because of this, he proposed the following method, the following steps. And it's a three-step program. Step one, reduce all concepts into their elementary components. For example, in the case of mathematics, it all goes down to zeros and ones. In the case of geometry, it all goes down to, well, points and, you know, planes. You can do all of geometry, you know, with the xyz axis and just defining things by points. Now, we think, you thought that the same would also apply to other things. So in the case of law, for example, it would be actions, promises, etc. In the case of politics, it would be comparable things. So he believed, perhaps incorrectly, that you could take any complex thing and reduce it down to the simplest. You know, just like with the mathematics, reduce it to zeros and ones, with geometry, reducing it down to points and planes, and a you know, law, reducing it down to the, the components of that. And then it applied everything politics, ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, or so we claim. So, first step, reduce it down to the building blocks, the simple components. Step two, developing mathematical symbols which form the language of thought. The view was, is that anything you can think, you can represent by mathematical symbols. Now, and of course in the case of math, we know that's true. You know, so we can symbolize stuff. But he believed that you could develop a, uh, there was a language of thought, and we could represent all thoughts by this mathematics. The third step was this. So once you get to the symbols, and the symbols, 
The third step is developing the rules for combining the symbols to make a grammar of the symbolic language that would match the world's logical structure. And his claim was this. Things that are true would match the structure of the language. Things that were false would break that structure. So here was his, his dream, that what we would do is build a, a language, the ultimate language, which would contain you know, for you know, each of the, the areas, perhaps one ultimate language for everything, where you'd have the simple components, the rules of putting them together, and then you'd assemble them. And you'd be able to tell by their assemblage whether it was true or not. Now, if that worked, that would be pretty remarkable. And what he thought it would do is this. First, it would create a universal language. So in his ideal, if you were a scientist of any sort or a philosopher, you would, just like you know, people learn in you know, physics and so forth, learn math, and in philosophy, learn logic, you would learn this language, whatever it be called. I guess we'll call it that language. And it would be, you know, the symbols, the rules, etc. And then you could communicate with anybody that knew also knew the language. And the view is not uh, that far fetched because if you go anywhere in the world and someone knows math, you may not be able to like talk to them, you know, in their language, but you could math with them. You, know, you, could, you could do math stuff and they would get it. Or if you're, you know, people who know law and logic. You may not be able to speak to them in their language, but you can logic with them. Of course, this won't help you like find the bathroom or you know, you know, know where your you know your hotel is, but you can math and logic with them, which I guess is something. Secondly, and this is uh, well the two two main parts of it, which would be extremely incredibly useful is this. Now Given his claim that once you get the you know things reduced down to simple bits and then develop a language for it, I'll just make up some, you know, some symbols, and then you have the rules for combining them together. What do you think would happen is this: the way you can discover new truths once you have the rules and the bits of language is by assembling stuff. And if you assemble things correctly by and it fits the rules, whatever is you know, created by that language, that ultimate language, would be true. And if, if, it was, if it was badly formed against the rules, it would be false. I mean, in logic, if you uh, take the logic class, there's a concept of what's called the, uh, a whiff, a well-formed formula, properly constructed. Now, of course, in logic, you can have something that's well-formed that's not true. But this language would have the amazing property of you could not say untrue things in the language because it, it would, the grammar would be broken. And that would be incredibly useful because all you'd have to do is sit down and you know, combine stuff together. If it works, you'd know that it was true. So what you could do is just sit down and write stuff out. And you could just discover stuff by writing. You know, Because if you put it together and it fits the rules, it's got to be true. And in theory, you could build, you know, we could build a machine that would answer all the questions. If it had this language and the rules, and you could just go assemble all the things together and give us a big, you know, book of all the things that are true. Now, did that work out? No. No. But it kind of did. How so? Well, one example of where this does kind of work is, think about um, computer models for engineering, computer-assisted design. What they try to do in that computer model is build a perfect model of reality such that whatever works in the model will work the same way in reality. And so it's much cheaper, of course, to go and put something into a computer and see if the you know, design of the plane will work and just build a plane. <coughs> and so what they're trying to do essentially is do what Leibniz wanted to do. Build you know, 
have a complete understanding of the civil components for, say, engineering, say, you know, engineering, aircraft engineering, have all the rules and put it together, and that way you'd be able to tell whether something was a viable aircraft design. Another example is in medicine. Just taking, um, you're just making up, you know, just taking compounds and like injecting them into rats or something, we're just kind of guessing. We're, we're like, okay, here's some chemicals, let's stick these into some rats and hope that stuff works out. What they're working on is a similar sort of thing. Imagine you take all the chemicals, break them down to their you know, similar components, take all the organisms, you know, break them down to the similar components, and then have a rule set that would tell you what, say, this chemical would do to humans, or what this chemical would do to cancer. And they're, you know, they're working, that's exactly what they're in fact working on, trying to develop a computer model that would enable them to test drugs. Because, again, just taking like chemical, say, okay, let's, we, this is similar to chemical we already understand, uh, that chemical is kind of good against cancer, so let's get a bunch of rats and shoot them up with this, this chemical. Oh, they all die. Uh, I guess we try something else. But if you just, you know, have a computer running, you know, and then you know, a week later it says, boom, here's your cure for colon cancer. Boom. Here's your cure for diabetes. Zap. Here's your cure for, you know, uh, angry leg syndrome. kidney prognosis, or whatever. And that'd be super handy. Another example is, of course, predicting the weather. How do we try to predict the weather now? Yeah, you know, we use satellites to get images of things. We plug them into the program, and the program says, yeah, 40% chance of rain. And what we're trying to do is exactly that. Break weather down to simplest bits, have a language, have a grammar, you have the programming, that tells us what's going to occur. And ideally, what we want is a, a program that tells us 100% you know, accuracy. This is, you know, uh, 43 days from now, there'll be a you know, tornado hitting this house, this house, and this house. So don't be there <laughs> at that time. And that'd be super useful. And so in a way, we didn't achieve Lattice's goal. We don't have that ultimate language. But we do have systems that are like that. So in a way, his, his dream is slowly becoming true. We do have systems that do that kind of stuff. Secondly, in addition to being able to find you know, new stuff just by you know, calculating or today grinding through a computer, it also would provide an objective way of settling all disputes, at least a lot of us believe. So if we wondered, like, is this actually true, you'd sit down and work it out. This is something we already do in science. For example, if you have two people disputing about whether a bridge will be able to sustain you know, the weight of a, a particular vehicle going across it, you can do the math and get what you hope is the right answer. And his, his hope was we could solve all disputes that way. So you might say, well, is abortion morally right or wrong? Well, let's take out our markers and shh, 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 let's work it. Let's do the equations. Boom. You get the result. Or so we could. Now, in the case of something like physics, we probably accept, yeah, there's a definite answer. But a good question would be, would it also work for, like, law? Could you just go, ch -ch 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 -ch. oh, I guess that should be illegal. <laughs> none of that stuff. Or, ch -ch -ch. oh, I guess that's really morally wrong. So, none of that stuff. Which is an important but separate question. Now, he was working, of course, well, I guess the, I'll put it as a question. Was Latin's right? Could we, could we have someday an ultimate language? And then this is something you know that's common in science fiction, where they you know the story they build a computer, they put in all the information, and it can answer all the the questions. And then it kills all of us because it's, that's how it goes. Mm -hmm. But could there be an ultimate language that does all that? That would be able to you know that would essentially, to use a metaphor, mirror the language of God. Only way to find out. <laughs> Keep trying. So, perhaps. Now, of course, it does raise the questions that I raised before is, is everything such that it could be put into that kind of language? Is there, are there definite answers in 
all areas like ethics, aesthetics, etc. One must think so, but it is a good question. You know, is there a true and definite answer to whether abortion is morally wrong or not? Is there a true and definite answer to whether the economic distribution of the country is just or not? Now, we've got a couple of assumptions. Assumption one. He believed that all elements of thought could be reduced down to those components. Secondly, Leibniz was super optimistic. Do you know how long he thought it would take to finish this project? For five years. He said if he had taught people working on it, five years, five and done. I mean, maybe he was right. Maybe you know, we just didn't put enough effort in, into it. But he seemed pretty optimistic. Now, one thing that's interesting about Leibniz as well is that a lot of the work that he did, like I said, he just kind of, you know, he didn't you know, do it very systematically. And he would just you know, write stuff and you know, kind of set it aside. And they found a, a cache of his works. And he had actually solved many mathematical problems um, long before they were solved by other people. They're just like all these solutions just sitting in these boxes. It'd be, to use an analogy, it'd be like having a cure for cancer just sitting in somebody's attic, you know, like from 100, you know, 100 years ago. And they just didn't, just didn't get around to publishing. And so there may be other stuff out there that Leibniz saw that's just sitting around. And it's kind of an interesting thought. Think of all the people who are working on stuff and never published it. All the things that are maybe in someone's attic or somewhere that could solve all these problems. People just never thought it would, would succeed. And then, of course, a lot of people thought they solved all the problems, but they were, they were just, you know, wearing too much tinfoil. <laughs> now we turn to his epistemology, his theory of knowledge. Now, one of the big debates of this time, and even now, is the question of innate ideas or not. And again, draw them out. Here's the idea. Here's the mind. Now, if you believe in innate ideas, you believe that the mind is pre stopped The stuff is built into it. Now, there's all kinds of different approaches to that. Like Descartes believed, you know, God, you know, preluded us with ideas. If you believe in um, you know, if you don't believe in God, believe, say, in biology, there could be, like, built-in, you know, when the, when the brain, you know, grows, there would be built-in information, you know, sort of pretty hardwired into it. But the other view is basically, if you believe in ideas, you believe there's something in the mind built in. Again, going by usual analogy, today when you get a laptop or a tablet or a phone, there's already all kinds of stuff, isn't there? And so it's preloaded. And the ideas are like that. Like when you have your iPhone, you've already got you know, the phone app in there, you've got a lot of the Apple apps, you have an operating system, all that stuff in there. Now the opposing viewpoint is held by the empiricist, which is the tabula rasa, the you know, or blind slate. And that's the idea that there's nothing in there that you know, you're born, it's like, a, like an empty hard drive where there's no information in there and everything pours in through the, the senses. Now, Leibniz in his book, New Essays Concerning Human Understanding, was a response to Locke's essay concerning human understanding, a direct reply. Now here's how Leibniz argued for innate ideas. He says this. If we can find ideas that could not come from the senses, not come from outside, then they've got to be innate, which is a you know, pretty good line of reason. If it didn't come from the outside, it's always had to, it always had to, to be there. So what sort of things could not come from the senses? Well, this is what he claims. He claims that necessary truths, you can't see necessity through the senses. 
So, if we have the idea of necessary truths, they had to come from not the senses. They had to come from somewhere else. They had to be innate. Now, he has sort of an interesting reply to Locke, because and it's a pretty reasonable consideration, which is this. He says, there's nothing present in the intellect that was not first in the senses, except, this is the critical part, for the intellect itself. And he claims that if Locke were right, that if the mind were a blank slate, we could not have the knowledge we need. Now, one way to look at it is, to use an analogy, is this. Suppose you take a computer, and you've got a blank hard disk, and you just you know, plug in the hard, blank hard disk. And then you plug in a camera, and a microphone, and you sit there and wait. What's going to happen? Yeah, nothing. It can't, it can't do anything. Because it, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't have an operating system. It doesn't have any drive. It doesn't have any software. So my guess is if Leibniz are around today talking about computers, he'd probably use that, that analogy. Because what you have to have in there to make it work is you've got to have an operating system. You've got to have you know, all the stuff built in to make that, that work. Now, of course, in the computer, someone could take and put in the operating system, etc. But if we take the, order, the example like with a you know, creature, if it had really had nothing in there, no, no operating system, it wouldn't be able to do anything. So in a way, what, what Lives is kind of saying is, you know, the intellect itself is composed of native ideas. And using the modern analogy, he's essentially saying is that we are a built-in operating system. And without that, we couldn't do anything. Which seems, you know, plausible. And then, of course, there's, there's the debate about whether, you know, the intellect counts as ideas or not. Because, I mean, if you ask Locke, Locke would say, yes, we have the intellect, and that handles all this stuff. And Locke would say, well, you can't really do anything without or having ideas. And Locke would say, yes, it can. And Lives would say, no, it can't. Well, it would if they were wrong. They're both dead, so they don't really say anything mm -hmm. anymore. Now, one of the debates or discussions about innate ideas is concerns about like, what they are, how they're in there, what they're like. And just like, a, like in politics, some may believe in like small government or may believe in socialism, but people have very different manifestations. So for example, Bernie Sanders' view, even though he's left, is different from, say, Hillary Clinton, even though she's kind of left. Um, Jeb Bush's views, even though he's Republican, slightly different from Donald Trump's, even though he's a Republican. So someone could believe in innate ideas to say they could believe in small government or socialism, but have very different manifestations. So what does Leibniz accept? Well, he claims the mind has to have a certain structure to find universal and necessary truths. And he draws an analogy between the mind and a block of veined marble. Now, interestingly, this is something I learned from uh, researching Leibniz. Uh, everyone probably knows, like, uh, well, maybe not everyone knows this, but with wood, Wood is a certain grain. Have you ever whittled? Because I was around before the internet, so one of the things we'd do, and you'd sit there for real. You'd sit there with a knife, a pocket knife, because they were in a pocket knife back then, and you just whittle. And that was considered fun. God. Well, of course, you can make stuff out of it. Then we stab each other. That was fun. <laughs> then we go to the hospital. That was also fun. Yeah, childhood was tough then. Natural selection, it's finest. No protect yeah, really, no protective equipment. We had lawn darts. You know what lawn darts are? They were darn about this big, with a spiky thing on them, and you'd put a hoop on the ground, and you'd throw them to get in the hoop. And one person would stand behind the other hoops, and you'd throw them to try to stick them in the person's hoop. And they would kill a few people. They had natural selection. No bicycle helmets, good times, good times. It's a wonder we did not all die. <laughs> but anyways, so going with the whittling, part of the whittling thing was, of course, if you ever whittled, you know that wood is a grain. And it's easier to, you know, whittling you know, with the grains easier. 
And of course, sometimes there's like knots in it. It's, you know, it's harder to, to whittle. Now, marble, interestingly, is kind of the same way. I mean, marble is pretty hard, but apparently they're like veins in marble. They're like softer and harder parts. And so a sculptor, you know, who's good at her craft, who, just like a person who's good at, you know, carving wood, knows how to work with that. And so what he says is, you know, the mind is like a box of chocolates. No, I'm talking about it. It's like a block of marble with those veins in it. And the innate ideas are like those veins. And so what we do with experience, you know, kind of cuts down the marble, revealing what's already within it. Now, maybe a better analogy, and my didn't have this because it was way after his time, also when I was a kid, this will show how I don't know more things could have been done. There was a, a thing you could buy, which was a sculpting kit. But this was the 70s, so it was pretty lame. The 70s was kind of like the lame, the lame time. Uh, pet rocks, uh, that kind of bell bottoms, awful, awful stuff. And so some decent movies. But what they would do is they'd have uh, within the, they'd have like a lump of clay. And then there'd be a plastic figure, like of a baseball player or a horse or something. And literally, you'd get like a block of clay, and embedded in it would be the plastic thing. And what you'd do is you'd take like these plastic tools, and you'd cut away at the clay until you revealed the plastic figure with it. And I don't know what genius thought of that idea, but they still, I never know. I, I didn't buy a pair of rock either, because I was like, that's so stupid. But I knew people had them, and they sold them. And that seems what life is kind of as a mind. You know, the mind is like that clay block with a plastic thing inside of it, and that experience kind of wears that away until it's, it's revealed. But I do appreciate that, that that particular toy gave me a good analogy. So thank you. I think it was Hasbro. So thank you for that, that crappy toy, because <laughs> it's a good analogy. So that answers a couple questions. One is, you know, why aren't we aware of all these ideas like right off the bat? And the answer is, well, why can't you see the plastic horse in a block of clay? Well, the answer is because it's a big block, block of clay around it. And so experience, you know, has a role and removes the clay, revealing what's in it. Now, of course, the empiricists would say, no, it's not, it's not the Experience removing the clay, revealing the block that's already in there. Experience gives you the, the figure. It puts it puts it in there. Now, one of the main arguments given by the empiricists against the ideas is this. And I'll use an analogy. Suppose somebody claims there's something in their attic. What's an easy way to test that? Yeah, you go and look. And if you don't see anything, nothing there. Unless it's invisible, like in the horror movies. You're in trouble. <laughs> so don't go in the attic. Because if someone says they got something horrible in the attic, there's no reason to go up there because if they're lying, you're wasting your time. And if there's something horrible in the attic, you don't want to be up there with it. So just, that's what I, my view would be. It's like, okay, think of something horrible in the attic, let's just uh, nail that shut and just you know, not go up there anymore. In fact, let's just burn down the house. <laughs> Problem solved. Oh, no, but actually, no, you can't burn out the house because then it might escape. So you just leave the house there and you just go somewhere else, maybe like the Bahamas or something. <laughs> Some place in the aeronautics. Now, Locke says, if people had any ideas, they'd always be aware of them, just like in the attic. It's something you're trying to keep be able to notice it. Lime, of course, has to reply to that because if you ask people, you know, if you ask like kids, you know, do you have any ideas in your mind, they would say, So here's his solution. He says we can't, we shouldn't imagine that these ideas, these innate ideas, are just we, that are they're like written in the soul, like pages, like words in a book. So we just can't go and look at them. And he thinks that it's something we have to go and really look for and try to try to find. So it's in there, but it's not just like right out in the open. So it's not like this room, but like the desk being innate in it. And so he claims, this may seem kind of like a cheat, but any ideas are not like in there, already fully formed, just obvious and evident. 
they're there as inclinations, dispositions, habits, or natural capacities. Now, of course, a critic might say, well, that's so, that's so weak that there seems to be no difference between that and not having any ideas at all. If you use an analogy, it'd be like saying, uh, claiming you've got a bookshelf when all that's there is like some wood. I mean, true, yeah, you can make the wood into a bookshelf, but it's not really a bookshelf. Now, a big part of the dispute is this. Locke and Descartes claimed the mind was transparent. In other words, for the most part, when your inner eye was peering around in there, you would be able to see everything in there, that there's nothing hidden in the mind. Leibniz, though, claimed that people can experience things without being consciously aware of it. And he uses an example. People who've lived near a waterfall their whole life, they don't notice, you know, if you point it out to them, you know, do you notice the waterfall? They'll say, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, or a modern example would be this. If you ever lived um, like in a city, where there's like a, a street with a lot of traffic, eventually what happens? Like at first, if you're like, if you're from some place that's not, not very you know, noisy, and you move someplace like it's a city, at first, all the noises are really annoying. But then what happens? Yeah, all that, you know, sirens and gunfire, people <laughs> crying out for help. Um, it all just kind of fades into the, into the background. And also, you know, like, all background noises kind of, kind of do that unless they're really annoying. And so Lyman says you can have things that you're experiencing, but you're not being consciously aware of it. And he says the mind has various levels. So we could use the analogy of like a, well, like water. You know, the first level of water, of course, if you, if you gaze into like the ocean, is transparent. So there's like some fish there, like a shark or something, swimming up by you. You can see that pretty easily. But of course, deeper down, it gets, darker and darker. You can't, you can't see. And so he sees the mind as having levels, or in my ocean analogy, of having depths. And there could be things down there that you don't immediately see. You have to go looking for them. So again, going with like the ocean analogy, there's like, you know, a giant squid down there. You're not gonna see, you're not gonna see them hanging out on the surface. You gotta go looking for the squid. Now, in addition to sort of the the very philosophical question about are there any ideas that can be in there we're not aware of, there's also the more general psychological question, which is can there be things in our mind that we are not aware of? And the answer seems to be, well, are you aware of all the contents of your mind all the time? No, because it'd be like, um, yeah, like when they show like a, like in a movie or TV show, and they show like all the feed going to like a TV to show like confusion or something. It'd be like having like eight thousand channels at once. You'd just be, ah. <laughs> yeah, because if you had everything going at once, you wouldn't be able to function. You'd be too much stuff, and we have all kinds of stuff kind of stored. There. And sometimes it comes up, um, you know, by surprise. And sometimes you can't find stuff. Like you know, like when you're taking a test, you're like. I know this, I know this, but it's, you know, but it's, hang, it's like hanging out under a rock and refusing to, to come up. And then sometimes things will just pop out of, you know, out of nowhere. You'll remember, remember something. Like, oh yeah, that was the answer. Right. Yeah, so a lot of this does seem to be right that the mind is not totally transparent. Otherwise, we, would, we wouldn't forget stuff. you just go and just see it. Now, there is also a important sort of a legal issue as well here, is could there be stuff in there that's like hidden and repressed? The reason I bring this up is that uh, some years ago, there was this big thing with repressed memories. And there were uh, therapists who were claiming that, they, that you know, all these kids had been you know, basically abused or molested as children, even though they had no conscious memory. And what they would do is they would, you know, bring forth those memories. 
And at first, that was kind of all the rage, because the idea was they could have these memories that they themselves were not, never aware of. And that the, the, ther the idea was a therapist would go and find those repressed or hidden memories. Now, it turned out, because people were kind of suspicious, like, wow, that seems like a lot of abuse. It seems like everybody was abusing their, their kids. That seemed pretty extreme. And there seemed to be like no evidence of any of this. And they found out that in some cases, you know, there was duplicity going on. But in some cases, the therapists were, were sort of honestly implanting memories in the kids in a way, bringing up things that never actually happened. And so it does raise, you know, an important point. Can there be stuff in there that's hidden away? Press memories. Could be. And they're actually they're actually working on ways. If you ever saw the uh, movie uh, uh, Charles Sunshine of the Spotted Spotless Mind, where they go and erase out bad memories. They're actually working on something kind of like that. And the idea is to excise memories of you know that, that cause post-traumatic stress disorder, which is basically delete those out. And of course, like all things, it sounds good, but it'll probably be you know, horrible, horrible <laughs> side effects as a general rule. But it is an interesting you know, philosophical and psychological question, a practical question. Can there be stuff in there we're not, we're not aware of? What, kind, what things lurk in the depths of our mind? Now, Leibniz also continues the adventures in necessity and contingency. The thinkers during this time were fairly concerned about that, that question. What things have to be and cannot be otherwise? And is there things that do not have to be that could be otherwise? Now, Leibniz draws the following distinction, which becomes a pretty standard distinction. Which are between, which is between truths of reason and truths of fact. Here's the difference. A truth of reason is a truth that is necessary. As I say, it's true and it's got to be true, it can't be false. And so the opposite of it is impossible. In contrast, a truth of fact is contingent and their opposite is possible. To give a simple a couple of simple examples. A truth of reason it would be something like, well, my, our old friend, triangles have three sides. That's true, it's gotta be true, and it's opposite, the triangles don't have three sides, is impossible, inconceivable, in fact. Now, a truth that would be a truth of fact would be that this triangle is yeah, about two inches. Yeah, two by two by two, probably. Bad distance. It, it's got a size. Now, of course, that's a that's a contingent truth because, of course, I could resize, you know, the triangle, or like the color. You know, I could I could color it, change its color. So so far, so good. Now, according to Leibniz, the truths of reason are based on two principles, contradiction and identity. Now, the principle of contradiction, if you had the logic class, is, well, what? What is a contradiction? Or just a normal life? If someone says, contradict yourself, sir. Yeah, yeah it does, doesn't make sense. And it makes the least amount of sense possible because if it's a contradiction, it can't be, it can't be true. It's impossible. In fact, in, um, in logic, a contradiction strictly defined is a claim that is always false. And it's false because of its logical structure. The simplest and classic example is the claim, you know, P and not P. Today is Thursday and today is not Thursday. That's impossible. Because it's either Thursday or not Thursday. It can't be. Now, the principle of identity is this. Each thing is what it is. It actually goes back to Aristotle. Aristotle says A is A. Each thing is what it is. Now, is that true? 
is each thing what it is, and not something else. Yeah. It seems to be a fairly self-evident truth. It's kind of the beginning. I mean, it's one of those things you might think, well, it's too obvious to even state, but it is a pretty clear starting point. A thing is what it, what it is. Now, the contradiction part, pretty straightforward. If something's in contradiction, impossible for it to be true. And so a truth of reason would be the opposite of a contradiction. I mean, a super easy way to do that would be, you know, the game. So P and not P is always false. So not P and not P is always true. But uh, eternal truth. Now, what about the principle of identity, that each thing is what it is? Well, he claims an identical proposition is the truth of reason whose denial creates a contradiction. For example, if we say that a square has four sides, we're saying A is A. A square is four-sided. Four-sided is a square. And the denial that he claims creates a contradiction. Now, this is known today as a tautology. Which is the opposite of contradiction. A tautology is such that it's always true and true in virtue of its logical structure. So for truth of reason, we have two types. Contradictions that are the opposite, they're always false. And we have tautologies that are always true. And so Leibniz believes that there are truths of reason that are, of course, true, and they're always true, and they're true based on either principle of contradiction, namely that you know, they are the denial of the impossible, or the principle of identity, which is A is A. So squishing them together, we get it such that to deny an identity is, of course, a contradiction. That is to say that A is not A, which is a contradiction. And so he thinks that all truths of reason boil down to that. Anyway, next we meet on the Tuesday, we'll examine the truths of fact. And until then, do some stuff. Have a good Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. uh, or a bad one. Whatever you <laughs> <laughs>